Okay, let me move on to today's event. I'm really, I'm really thrilled and honored uh, that my colleagues are able to to be with us today from South Africa, and um, we have two people who are presenting uh, today, and that's Catherine Oral and Lauren Jennings. Dr. Catherine Oral is a clinical pharmacologist and a clinical trial specialist. Um, she's been a PI and co-I in, in clinical research at Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, which a lot of you are aware of. Um, she's been a PI on 20 clinical trials, more than 30 trials of, of antiretroviral drug, drugs, um, just a lot, of, a lot of clinical and clinical trials experience. She's an experienced clinician, and she played an integral role in developing several HIV care and treatment services in the Cape Town area. And over the past 20 years, she's developed a deep interest in factors promoting the success of antiretroviral therapy when delivering in a resource poor setting to large numbers of people, including adherence, retention of care, and task shifting. Um, and Lauren Jennings, who uh, has joined the team, well, I'm, I'm gonna mention the team in reference to uh, <laughs> The, the study that's being presented today. But Laura Jennings is, is also a medical doctor. She also has a master's in public health, also based in Cape Town, South Africa. She's been working as a research medical officer investigator at Desmond Tutu Health Foundation uh, Center for Adherence and Therapeutics since 2019. Um, what I was making reference to is I had the great pleasure of, of being a multiple PI with Catherine on what we call our ad art study, which is what you're gonna be hearing about today. And this was really a really wonderful and well implemented study. Thank you to Catherine and, and Lauren and their team in Cape Town. And um, we had many wonderful, wonderful visits there during the, the conduct of an implementation of this study. So you're gonna hear about it. Um, I'm just thrilled that I got to take part on this in this with them, along with other members of our team and including Ruben Robbins and. Chris Ferraris and others. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it, the podium over to Catherine and Lauren and um, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, Bob. That's a very kind and generous introduction. And I think probably the most important part being that we had great fun being MPIs on this project from, um, well, as we went into no cost extension mode, it wasn't 2015 to 2020, but more like 2015 to 2022. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak on um, the, 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 I'm gonna introduce the topic of, um, of adherence and, and managing ARV adherence in South Africa and our project, which explored the utility of ART drug levels and dry blood spots. Um, then Lauren will talk us through the AIM-1 methods and findings, and then I will uh, I will pop back and talk about the AIM-2 um, findings. Um, so let's get going. Right. So as you know, um, Bob and I were the dual principal investigators, but obviously we don't ever work in isolation. So you can see on the left-hand side there, the involvement of the uh, Columbia team and on the right-hand side, the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation team. And we also were supported um, in our tenopavir diphosphate assays by Pete and Jose from the University of um, uh, Colorado um, in Denver. So I've been working in adherence adherence related issues for quite some time. Um, the scale up of ARVs in, in resource limited countries, including South Africa, have presented a lot of healthcare system challenges. Um, we have a lot of people living with HIV in South Africa. I think I think that's possibly a, a, a over seven and a half million, close to eight million people living with HIV in South Africa at the moment. Uh, we have over five and a half million people on ART which is pretty good, but of them, an estimated um, 43 to 86% have um, unsuppressed viral load. So we are some way off. I think the figure we'll probably see on the next slide that is most commonly quoted is about 67% of people are virally suppressed. And there's a bit of debate about whether that is 67% um, of those who arrive for a viral load which is probably the where the data is most likely to come from, as against 67% um, of those who are, who started ARVs. And there are quite a few, I think there's quite a lot of loss where people are no longer accessing care at all. And those people are sometimes forgotten in this unsuppressed viral load piece. 
we have very few providers per number of patients, which is why we've been a lot of focus on task shifting, use of community health workers, use of nurses to prescribe and monitor ARVs to try and maximize the use of our scarcer staff. And we do use a lot of um, health, lay healthcare workers to um, to keep to keep the system running. Um, we're not reaching our UNA's 90-90-90 goals. Um, we started out aiming for 90-90-90. They've now shifted to 95-95-95 by 2030, and we are quite a way off there. Um, as far as South Africa goes, we're, we're probably pretty good at our testing. So the vast majority of people, 92% of people um, living with HIV know their status. Um, 70% of people um, living with HIV are on treatment. And here we have 64% of people living with HIV who are virally suppressed. So there's quite a gap to our viral suppression targets. Um, and um, this is where we sort of thought we could help. We were looking basically here at at, um, at all ages. You can see uh, children are um, much harder to manage and their viral suppression rates were a lot lower. We, didn't, we don't actually work with children, but the younger the age, of people living with HIV and generally the worse their outcome. So the, the step to achieving viral suppression is to achieve adherence. We've got our treatment regimens down to a single daily dose. Um, however, monitoring of adherence is limited in many clinics. We know that non-adherence precedes viral rebound by some months, but in, um, in our setting, we only have a viral load once a year. So, um, if you're not monitoring adherence, it could be a whole year before anyone even notices that you you aren't actually achieving what you need to achieve with your antiretroviral therapy. So people don't they they they, they don't often well, if people ask about adherence, quite often they're told that their adherence is fine. Self-report um, in a sort of clinic setting, people say, no, no, doctor, I'm taking my tablets. I'm, I'm, so you get 100% adherence on self-report. Nobody does tablet counts in a clinic setting. They're too busy. Um, there are pharmacy refill options for people to, to review prescriptions, but that is not frequently done. So there's the, often the only way that poor adherence is picked up is when the viral load is raised. And that is too late, particularly on our on the regimens that we were using during this study, which is the Favarin's based regimens, which are much more um, unforgiving of missed doses. You get resistance quite quickly. Um, so although non-adherence precedes viral rebound, if you're not looking for that adherence, um, then you you can actually you can miss the fact that people are doing badly and you end up with your viral load testing being raised and you've missed critical times for intervention. Um, and I've kind of skipped ahead here. All adherence measures have challenges. Um, self report in, I think in a research setting, using liquid scales and monitoring it closely, it can be a useful, um, a useful tool. In a clinical setting, um, it's only really useful if you've got enough of a relationship with the, the patient or participant that they will actually tell you that they've missed doses. Um, most people seem to want to please, please us as clinicians. And so they tell us that they are taking the medication. So it doesn't give you that opening. Um, uh, pharmacy refills and pill counts are... Um, available but unused. Um, electronic monitoring devices is one of the ones we used in our study here. We used the electronic um, pillbox called the WISE pill, which we'll show you a picture of in a minute. So you can fit a month of medications in. And when you open and close it, it sends a signal via a short message, an SMS to a server. And so you can actually see more or less in real time when the pillbox is being opened, which you hope and has been shown to correlate with um, virological outcomes. And dose actually so that means it correlates with people actually taking the dose and not just opening the box that actually are most the vast majority of people are also taking their dose at the time and then we've got drug concentrations and for many years um as a pharmacologist whenever you look at the reviews of whether drug concentrations are useful in the setting of ARVs, we basically found they weren't. If you're looking at a short half-life moiety and you're taking the blood on the day someone comes to the clinic, quite often you get reasonable drug concentrations. And that's because they've taken their dose just before they've come to the clinic and you get no, um, you don't get any information about 
prior days dosing like if the drug is in the blood you get like yes the drug is there and that doesn't really help you that much um there's also a disconnect in the with the um least less robust arv treatment regimens the efavirenz based non-nuke based treatment regimens there's a disconnect between um a drug level and an, a virological outcome because if sometime during that year they had a people had an episode where they were not taking their medications they could have viral rebound and develop resistance you could have a raised viral load and start taking your drug again and have a perfectly good viral perfectly good drug level but with a raised viral load at the same time so uh, until very recently monitoring drug concentrations in people with hiv was not actually useful or linked to virological outcomes um our current treatment regimens are single dose single tablet daily fixed dose combinations we were using during the whole of the um of the M1 of ADART study, we were using tenofovir, emtricitabine, and efavirenz as a non-nuke based regimen. And then in 2020, just after lockdown from COVID, we switched people to tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. Both regimens are on um, used tenofovir. So when we're measuring our drug concentrations with tenofovir diphosphate, we can it's actually useful to look at adherence for both regimens. Um, dolutegravir based regimens, I'm sure you all know, have a better side effect profile and a higher barrier to resistance. They're slightly more forgiving of, of missed doses. Um, we usually only switch people to second line if they've been failing uh, dolutegravir based first line for a couple of years. So the current standard of care in South Africa, um, adherence measurement is done by self-report, which as I said, is not very good in terms of picking up people with poor adherence and viral load monitoring, which I've also said is too late. Our viral loads are not done at baseline. We do them only at month four, month 12, and then annually. And if a viral load is raised greater than 50 copies per mil, in theory, people are referred to a risk of treatment failure clinic, which is essentially um, a, a sort of data-driven counseling session with a clinician who basically says, hey, your viral load is raised. You're obviously not taking your tablets properly. And a number of um, adherence counseling sessions with a peer counselor. Um, people don't necessarily come to all the adherence counseling sessions. And in fact, in some clinics, I don't think this, this, this process exists at all. So even though it's written in guideline, it's not actually being implemented. Um, after that, you're supposed to repeat the viral load in three months time um, and then move on to second line. If it is still raised or if they're suppressed, they go back into sort of standard care process. Um, the risks of poor adherence are enormous in my mind basically if you if you're not taking your medications and you don't suppress your viral loads you don't maintain a high cd4 count which increases your risks of opportunistic infections poor health outcomes for the individual but also of real note is the risk of onward transmission if you have a raised viral load you can transmit that to your sexual partners you can transmit it from your from as a mother to an unborn child or in breastfeeding after the child is born and also obviously increases the risk of development, particularly with partial non-adherence where people are taking some drug, not taking some drug, taking it some days, getting down in that 70 to 80% range. There's an increased risk of development of antiretroviral resistance. So for our drug, for our study, what we wanted to do was um, have a look at basically two more or less novel ways of monitoring ARV adherence and see if we could derive any clinical benefit from knowing tenofovir diphosphate concentrations or from knowing wise pill, um, wise pill daily tablet dosing data. Um, as I mentioned, the assay of ARV drug concentrations presents opportunities and challenges. If, if it's got a very short half-life and a short window, um, then you can get what we call white coat dosing, which is essentially people coming to clinic having taken a tablet because they know they're coming to clinic. And so when you draw blood, you see they have drug, drug on board. But that And that hasn't correlated well with ARV outcomes to date. However, tenofovir diphosphate is a long half-life metabolite of tenofovir. It's um, and that might over, overcome some of these advantages. For those of you who are clinicians, this would be like measuring an HbA1c in a diabetic. It gives you an idea of their glucose over a period of time of six to eight weeks, um, even though um, it's um, uh, compared to the random glucose which you take at the immediate time you see them. So instead of this being a drug concentration, 
at one time point, it's giving us a window, a view of adherence behavior over the last few weeks. Um, and this might help us improve our adherence monitoring. We might uh, It might give an advantage in that we could recognize non-adherence before the viral load is raised. And um, if it was a low cost one, um, so if it was a low, if it was low cost and easy to administer, um, and this this objective measure of adherence would be really valued in our in our setting, really valuable in our setting. Um, this table just basically shows if you the use of both a viral load and pharmacological adherence measures together. If someone had a high drug concentration and a suppressed viral load, that's uh, that's an expected outcome. You'd give positive feedback and move on from there. If people had low drug concentrations and were viremic, then that is there's an adherence challenge causing viremia, and you would work on identifying the barrier. Um, some motivational interviewing, counseling, and moving on from there. And then the two opposite ones, if someone has a low drug concentration and viral suppression, then you're looking at potentially an impending problem and can also counsel then and identify the barriers to adherence and move from there. And in people with uh, high drug concentrations and viremia, then those people could be um, uh, resistant already because they're actually managing to, they have, have reasonable drug concentrations and viremic. So you would perform a genotype in those people. So having a pharmacological adherence measure together with the viral load could really add clinical value. This is how we measure the tenofovir diphosphate. We do it in dried blood spots. Um, you can do it by finger prick. You can do it by venous blood draw. You've got to fill those little circles um, on these uh, very expensive Botman 903 filter papers. And you get a measurement that's given back to you in a, in a, a femtomol per punch. And it's a three millimeter punch that's taken from saturated filter paper in the middle of that process. Tenofovir's um, metabolite, uh, tenofovir diphosphate, has a long half-life, uh, 17 days. So it's giving you a measure of adherence over the last six to eight weeks. Um, and it's fairly easy to transport this. It's fairly easy to do the samples. Um, but there are some limitations. It's giving you an average adherence. You can't determine a dosing pattern over the last six to eight weeks. It's giving you a, a flat line over that period of time. Other limitations are that these are still very expensive. They actually cost, at the moment, um, close to five times what a viral load would cost. So not going to be implemented in our setting until these become more cost effective. And there's a lab process that takes two to three weeks. So that it's not point of care. But there are people in the know in pharmacology labs who are working on both those issues. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to move forward with a, a point of care cheaper test for the same the same metabolite. So this just shows that the person in the, the little blue circle on the right hand side shows 50% adherence um, in, in this person and the tenofovir diphosphate gives you an averaged um, an averaged view. So you don't know if that person missed every second dose or if they took for two weeks and didn't take for two weeks. You're going to get the same 50% um, adherence um, on the on the on the other uh, at the end using tenofovir diphosphate. This is our electronic pillbox, the other method of other uh, measure we used for monitoring adherence. You can store a month's supply. We don't, that's a weekly little insert, plastic insert there with the red and green tablets. Um, we actually can, we've got one that just has two um, openings that so you can get 15 tablets into each. Every time you open it, it generates a signal. Um, and it has a rechargeable battery that lasts for up to six months. We give participants charges to take home, but we also charge batteries at site. And so when they come in in six months, we can actually replace, replace the battery. Um, it can has the option of having an, a, a heartbeat, which confirms its operational status every day. We can see if the people are online, if it's pinging the, the line, and you can get detailed adherence patterning from that. But we have to remember the disadvantage of that is it's measuring an opening. It's not measuring ingestion. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren to talk you through Adart AIM-1. Um, and Lauren's just going to tell me when to move the slides. Okay. Thank I'm going you. To yeah, you can go to the next one. Okay, so in Adart M1, um, in this M, we, we wanted to determine the ability of tenofovir diphosphate in dried blood spots to provide an objective and clinically relevant and actionable me measure of adherence in a low resource setting. 
Um, so to do this, we followed up a cohort for 12 months and we did monthly tenofovir diphosphate, monthly viral loads and continuous wise pool monitoring. So our aims were to firstly document the range of tenofovir diphosphate and dried blood spots in a cohort of South African um, patients who remained virally suppressed. Then secondly, to um, determine the concentrations of tenofovir diphosphate in real world use that can predict viral breakthrough um, and the lead time to that breakthrough um, that, can be, that is afforded by the assay. And then lastly, we wanted to compare the ability of tenofovir diphosphate and wise pill to predict future viral breakthroughs. Okay, so um, we conducted an observational cohort study at um, our Gugulechi research site in Cape Town. And this included 250 people living with HIV who were all on tenofovir containing uh, ART regimens for between four to 24 months at enrollment. Um, they had to have had some evidence of previous uh, difficulties with adherence, um, but they were all virally suppressed at their screening visit. Um, so as I mentioned before, we did we followed them for 12 months and we did um, monthly uh, tenofovir diphosphate, monthly viral loads, monthly self-reports, and then as well as regular BMI measurements and hematocrit measurements. Okay, so participants had 13 visits in total, so a baseline visit and then 12 monthly visits. Um, we collected sociodemographic, medical and psychosocial data at baseline and at the final month 12 visit. Um, we, uh, as I said, we did viral load monitoring throughout. And we, we had um, electronic adherence data that was continuously collected, um, but this was passive. So we didn't uh, provide electronic dosing related feedback to participants during the study. And then um, the tenofovir diphosphate was collected in the dried blood spots and batched and shipped to Colorado um, to Pete Anderson's lab. So these were not assayed in real time. And, and so in this study, we didn't provide real time feedback from the tenofovir diphosphate. So um, this is a flow diagram showing the participants' progress through the study. Um, so we approached 605 participants and reviewed um, the charts of 596 participants. And of those, 281 were found to be eligible to um, come to a baseline visit. Um, we completed 250 baseline visits, and then 224 of those participants eventually completed the um, month 12 visit. So our retention overall was good. Um, there were only 26 missed visits in total. Um, so we, we had six participants who were lost to follow up, five who withdrew voluntarily, and then two deaths. Next, please. Okay, so um, we completed the data collection for M1 in November 2019. 78% uh, of our cohort was female, and the median age was 34 years. So these are very typical numbers um, in our setting. Um, median BMI was 27, and the median hematocrit was 37%. And then if you look at the months on ART at study start, the median was 11 months. So in total, we had 2,944 paired dried blood spots and viral load samples. Um, and the median tenofovir diphosphate concentration for all participants over all visits was 1,041 fentanyls per punch. So on the next slide, um, you can see this figure that shows the median tenofovir diphosphate concentrations by viral breakthrough status. So the color coding here is, is based off of um, uh, dosing data that was derived from DOT studies in HIV negative adults taking PrEP. Um, so we had a total of 21 participants who developed viral breakthrough, and this was defined as um, confirmed viral load greater than 400 copies per mole. Um, and those participants had a median tenofovir diphosphate concentration of 325 fentanyls per punch, um, which, which compares to a median of 1057 in those who maintain viral suppression throughout the study. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, we were able to determine that when we adjusted for age, sex, BMI, and hematocrit, um, for those participants whose trafibrillin diphosphate was less than 400 fentanyls per punch, um, the odds of developing viral breakthrough one month later were 16 times greater than those with concentrations um, greater than 800 fentanyls per punch. And this odds ratio increased to 21 times greater for developing viral breakthrough at two months later. Um, so we also showed that the median uh, tenofovir diphosphate concentration decreased with increasing BMI, which was also shown in other studies. Okay, um, and then we we also looked at how well the electronic adherence data from WisePool correlated with the tenofovir diphosphate. And we found that as the um, drug concentration increased, so too the median wise pool in increased. Um, so showing that the wise pools were quite well used and correlated well to drug concentrations. Um, so this table shows uh, the logistic regression models with odds um, and adjusted odds ratios of viral breakthrough for every 5% increase in electronic adherence or 250 fentanyl per punch increase in tenofovir diphosphate concentration at different time points. So we've got at breakthrough, at one month prior to breakthrough and at two months prior to breakthrough. So for electronic adherence, um, the odds ratio didn't change when adjusting for confounders um, and the adjusted odds ratio increased with increasing time prior to breakthrough. Um, and then for the tenofovir diphosphate, for every 250 fentanyl per punch increase, the adjusted odds of viral breakthrough were actually similar at the three different time points. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So then um, we can see that both adherence measures were highly predictive and comparable. Um, so these receiver operator operating characteristic curves show um, show both methods, so electronic adherence at the top and tenofovir diphosphate at the bottom and the different time points. And um, all were predictive at the time, well, both were predictive at the time of breakthrough and remained predictive um, at one and two months prior to viral breakthrough. So um, in conclusion, we were able to establish the, the range of tenofovir diphosphate in a virally suppressed South African cohort. And we were also able to identify the concentration, threshold concentration that is strongly predictive of future viral breakthrough up to two months prior. So this finding has significant clinical, clinical benefits as it allows um, clinicians sufficient time to review results of tenofovir diphosphate um, and to implement adherence support measures prior to the viral load um, uh, rising. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when 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 we use the tenofovir diphosphate in conjunction with viral load, we can see, as Catherine mentioned on that other figure, that high drug concentrations um, in the DBS with viremia can help us to identify patients who have ART drug resistance. And then lastly, we showed that both WisePol and tenofovir diphosphate are predictive of future viral breakthrough and that there are pros and cons to each, which Catherine outlined in the introduction. So this was our first paper um, that we published in AIDS. Um, and then we published the follow-up paper. I'll just go a little next one. Then our follow-up paper, which was in JADES, which compared the two. And then we've recently published um, some data about looking at the 21 cases of virological breakthrough um, and the relationship between the tenofovir diphosphate concentrations and drug resistance um, at the time of failure. So we had, as I said, 21 breakthroughs. Um, we did the genotype, the drug resistance genotype one month later than the breakthrough was initially identified which means that for 10 participants, we weren't able to, they had resuppressed and we weren't able to um, do a genotype. Um, we, had, we had eight participants, which we did a genotype and three had no resistance and five 
showed that they had resistance. And if you look at the um, viral loads, you can see that the viral loads were higher in those with no resistance. Um, and if you look at the tenofovir diphosphate concentrations, um, they were lower in those with no resistance and higher um, in those with resistance, but still very low. So that just shows that um, it's the it's the partial adherence that leads to the development of resistance. Next slide. And then we were able to put some um, tra trajectories together. And um, so you can see the four categories that we had. So at the bottom, we've got on the left, um, viral breakthrough with resistance and on the right viral breakthrough uh, without resistance. Um, and you can kind of see that the ones with resistance have a sort of slow decline in their tenofovir diphosphate concentrations over time, which eventually leads to the development of resistance. But when there's no resistance, it's been quite low throughout or a very sudden drop in um, drug concentrations. And ooh, the title's gone, but this is um, a slide um, talking about what future uh, analyses we'll do using the M1 data. So we've got a lot of psychosocial um, information from our baseline and month 12 uh, visits. Um, so we will look at associations with adherence and the, the virological outcomes. Um, so those are some of the um, questionnaires that we did. Um, and then we have, you know, we have lots of collaborators and a large working group with access to all the data and people are coming up with very interesting um, things that they're busy with. So we will have more to share in time. And that's that. Go. Thank you, Lauren. I will move on to sharing AIM, the data from AIM2, which was a, a smaller study. Um, and this study, the 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 the, the um, aim of AIM two was to determine the acceptability and feasibility. This was a pilot study um, of giving patients and providers monthly feedback about tenofovir diphosphate concentrations. So having established that this would be beneficial for our participants if the drug concentrations were low to allow time for intervention, we thought it would be good to see if we could um, see if this was feasible and acceptable. And we wanted to look at provider and patient behaviors in response to receiving the tenofovir diphosphate phosphate concentrations. Um, well, our findings were intended to provide pilot data for a future larger trial to establish the impact of drug level feedback on people's adherence related behaviors and on medical management by providers and obviously clinical outcomes. So um, in step one, um, we had AIM-1 informing A2 and uh, via a, a, a couple of um, was more than a couple actually of, of feedback development workshops. Um, so we presented the findings of AIM-1 to both patient and provider groups in order to share the study outcomes with those stakeholders and to assess people's understanding of the meaning of the tenofovir diphosphate drug concentrations and to determine the preferred messaging if we were going to deliver that those drug concentrations to the two patients, well, how would they like to see it? What would they like it to look like? And also what method would they like us to deliver that monthly feedback um, by? Um, so firstly, the patient um, um, feedback development workshop, we had 15 attendees. Um, when well, we talked about understanding the dry blood spot concentrations, they generally seemed to understand it fairly, um, very clearly. Um, they needed to understand some, have some education about potentially the values, what the numbers actually meant, similar to learning about what a CD4 of 200 means compared to a CD4 of 500 and what viral load suppression and things like that is. It would be another thing to learn, but not too complicated to learn. Um, interestingly, there was no single preferred method of communicating drug concentration results. Um, people were more comfortable with normal or fine results being conveyed via um, message or voicemail on their phones. Um, there was an urban myth that people wouldn't like to get anything on their phones because other people could see it. But one guy told us quite clearly, don't be silly. You know, we have passwords on our phones. Not anyone can see what's on our phones. Um, and But for low people who needed adherence intervention and who had low drug concentrations, um, there seemed to be a general preference for a direct person-to-person -person approach. So either to present them with that result at the next visit or by phone call. Um, and a very strong emphasis, which unfortunately comes from a healthcare service that is overwhelmed and often unfriendly in our setting, is that whether on the phone or in person, the message should be respectful and non-judgmental language should be used all the time. 
Um, we had um, 11 attendees at our provider um, workshop, which I have to say is pretty good. It's hard to get people to come to these meetings. Um, and, and they were all generally very comfortable. There were some doctors, there were some nurses at this meeting. Providers were generally comfortable with using these dry blood spot values and indicated they'd be relatively easy to understand. They did ask for an interpretation with each result. So as with all viral loads, we should be giving, as with all lab results, we should be giving a normal range. All the lab results come with a sort of, are they flagged, are they out of range, and what that normal range is. Um, and they would prefer results to come to them in the same format that the usual lab results come in. Um, however, they did request that we actually only bring low results to their attention. So we would place them in the clinical charts and for normal results not to be placed in the in the clinical charts. Basically, so we're not overwhelming them with things that are not of clinical relevance or not important at the time. So we developed visual messages to accompany the actual drug concentration levels. And this was in both our patient and provider feedback that went into the folders. Uh, green basically saying that you've got a high drug concentration, more than a thousand femtomoles per punch, basically all is well. Uh, Suboptimal drug concentration between, um, between 600 and 900 femtomoles per punch. And the red were the, those people that we considered at risk of treatment failure in sort of more immediately and who needed intervention straight away. And then what we did is we recruited 60 participants, um, 18 or over on ARVs for more than four months and on a tenofovir based regimen. And we randomized them 30 to receive intervention of their dry blood spot regularly um, once a month and 30 to receive no feedback. Um, we could do this because Pete Anderson's lab had um, done some knowledge transfer with the University of Cape Town Clinical Pharmacology Laboratory. So we could actually, we didn't have to ship individual dry blood spots all the way to Colorado. We could actually just ship them up the road to the University of Cape Town and they could do a nearly, well, it's real-time results for us. It still took two to three weeks to get a result back, but we had the result back before the following um, participant visit. Um, we used patient messaging um, content and delivery techniques as informed by our, our FDWs with the patients. Uh, the study staff provided the tenofovir diphosphate results to the participants. So we took the responsibility of providing those results to the participants. And we reviewed people's medical charts to see if the medical providers had reviewed res the results and if they took any follow-up action with those results. We basically, people had five visits. Um, we collected similar things to AIM-1, a viral load, a wise pill data, tenofovir diphosphate and self-report across five visits. Um, remember, people are randomized to two arms and we did some exit interviews as well. So providers were consented for ongoing review of any clinical chart notes they made as a result of reviewing the tenofovir diphosphate results. And we developed a study sheet that, um, that asked for a signature when reviewed and a brief note of any follow-up that was made, such as referral to enhanced adherence counseling. Um, and only the yellow or red categories were sent to the providers. Um, and we did one last semi-structured focus group at the end of the study to solicit opinions from the providers on the process. So here's our consort flow. We screened 60 patients and we retained, um, and we had 30 in each arm. And, uh, and our, by visit four, we had lost one in each arm. So generally fairly good retention. Um, our demographics were similar um, as well to our, um, uh, our aim one slightly slight preponderance of women in 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 both arms and they were quite well balanced by arm and an age of 39 also fairly well balanced by arm um we put body mass index in um and uh, like we do hematocrit because those impact on the tenofovir diphosphate concentration so um if you have a higher body mass index you might have a lower tenofovir diphosphate and if you have a low hemoglobin you might also have a lower tenofovir diphosphate so those are just things we put into sort of control our our, our outcomes um, but you can see the hematocrits and things were, there, were more or less even by arm. And then we had people had a lot longer time on ARVs, um, 56, 52, 68 months compared to our AIM-1. These people were more um, ART experienced. 
So this is quite a detailed table. Um, it has essentially got outcomes running down the left, um, total in the first two columns by intervention and control, and then um, each visit, visit one, visit two, visit three, and visit four running across the top. Um, I think the key points to note are mostly in the total column, which was that in our intervention arm, um, overall, uh, we had significantly more tenofovir diphosphate or tenofovir diphosphate concentrations were higher in our intervention arm in the people giving feedback than in the control arm. If you looked at it by arm, in each at each visit, the concentration was higher in the intervention than in the control. However, it only reached significance in visit two and overall in total. Um, why split adherence wasn't significantly higher in any arm, but the trend was to increased adherence in the intervention arm across all visits. Um, and if you look at the quartiles, so the quartiles for adherence being broken up, first quartile is 0 to 70%, second quartile 71 to 89%. Third quartile, 90 to 95, and over 95 being the fourth quartile, that there was a, a general improvement um, in the intervention arm. Fewer people in the lower adherence categories and more people in the higher adherence categories by quartile in the um, in the intervention arm. And this slide shows something very similar, that essentially um, at visit one, the quartiles looked very similar by control and intervention. And by the end, if you look at it over time, there was a shift in the intervention arm of people into the higher quartile. So we did some shifting of adherence up a quartile potentially over that short study that we did there. Um, when we looked at our exit interviews, um, we did a five point look at scale to look at acceptability of the 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 drug feedback measure. Um, and people said things like the education I received about these dry blood spots was very helpful. The way I received these results was helpful. And I made changes to my behavior based on some of these results. All participants in the intervention group said that the education they received was helpful. Um, and they um, all all indicated um, that the way they received the results was helpful, and it was following their preferred methods. 86% of people, if you felt was very hopeful, reported pill-changing behavior because of these results, and um, reported increased vigilance in daily pill-taking and making changes to their daily routine to ensure the, the pill-taking was feasible. Um, we didn't have as much success with our providers, um, we of the 84 tenofovir diphosphate concentrations, 29, 34% were in the yellow or red categories, and they were therefore printed and placed with a nice bright colorful chart in the clinic's chart, and they were emailed to the provider. Um, none of those study sheets were signed off on, indicating a review, and nobody wrote down that they'd done any activities based on based on our uh, providing our beautiful results. Um, we when we look, when we had the focus group discussion with seven medical providers in the AIM two focus groups, only one nurse indicated she'd even seen the results and conveyed them to the patient. She but even she did not make a note that she had reviewed those results. And essentially, we thought that. You know, this was 84, Google Air 2 CHC is a very large clinic. They have over 9,000 patients um, on their books currently attending and collecting medication. And we put um, uh, very pretty results, admittedly, but only in 84 of those folders. And so they were probably lost in the busy clinic and that we would need to highlight, it would either need to be done for everybody. So it was a standard practice across the board for everybody, which at the moment is not feasible from a, um, a finance point of view, or we would need some other method to highlight these results. The staff did like the imagery. They did feel comfortable in using that to convey that to the patients, but just the, with the sort of drop in the ocean that we had done, it was actually more or less missed. The other option would be for not only the clinicians, but also the counseling team to have access to these tenofovir diphosphate results. So we could look at other ways of engaging the staff using a whole team, perhaps the pharmacy um, or the counseling team to engage these results. So our conclusions for M2 were that we have, there was a high acceptability among people living with HIV, um, indicating that having the, 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 the drug concentrations may have changed their medication taking behavior in relation to receiving the adherence feedback. 
and that their acceptability and utility of the tenofovir diphosphate data is supported through the actual adherence data, suggesting the improvements among this intervention group as measured, um, we, that we actually did see improvements in adherence in the intervention group compared to control. And among providers, the information was acceptable, but we had low visibility of those results um, for those primary care providers. And Chris and Paul wrote a fantastic paper, which was published earlier this year, if anyone wants to go and have a look at that. Um, and then I think the last few, few slides, just to speak to future directions, um, our takeaway messages are essentially that M1 allowed us to establish a range of tenofovir diphosphate concentrations in dry blood spots in our South African population, which is important because it was different from the US population um, and from other European populations. We have lower concentrations and even lower in women compared to um, other concentrations. We identified a threshold concentration which was strongly predictive of future virological breakthrough, which is important to allow our clinical team sufficient time to receive results and initiate an intervention before people develop viral breakthrough. But we do need to test this concept um, prospectively. Um, then AIM-2, we tested this concept and found that in a busy real-world clinic um, that they that we could collect and process and get results back to people, um, but that and that patients found these acceptable and showed and showed a signal towards improving their medication taking behavior. But we had low provider review and actions, and that would also require some further research and input. Um, and so we hope to carry out uh, larger scale trials to assess the effect of concentration based feedback using tenofovir diphosphate on subsequent adherence and clinical outcomes. We need to explore other methods for provider review, such as using community healthcare workers, pharmacists and counsellors, and maybe integrate newer technologies to allow tenofovir diphosphate concentrations to become point of care testing and hopefully, fingers crossed, cheaper as well in that process. And that's it. And we are, we, we acknowledged our initial teams at the beginning, but we also had a lot of support from the NIH team. Tia Morton was our program officer. She was amazing throughout. And our medical officer um, and Neil Weatherall supported the lab side. They were also a really good team. Um, and it was a pleasure to work with them. Thank you very much. I think that's all. Right. Oh, it's great, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's even fun for me to hear that all summarized so well. <laughs> <It was good. laughs> Remind me of this well, well impl implemented and executed study, and um, reminds me of you know we've got more papers and more grants to write. <laughs> all right, um, I'm going to stop sharing for now, and then I can. There we go. I sure, the floor that. is open for, for questions and comments, and um, people can put a question in the chat, but also you can easily be unmuted and ask your question live yourself. See, people have raised hands. I'm actually not. Ruben made a comment saying it was a great talk. Yes, it was, Ruben. <laughs> Feel free to also speak if you'd like to. I can see if I, I do. Tanya or Chris, I may need your help in terms of, um, I don't know if I'm not yes, seeing. Yes, Bob May has a question. I can, un hold on okay, just. Great. Thanks, Tanya. Go ahead, May, you're unmuted. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, hi, my name is May Tan. I work with HIV affected populations in rural Zambia. And I was just wondering about the limitations um, or how you're thinking about the limitations regarding the focus on the single drug just because where I work, sometimes we have drug shortages and we can't always get the regimens that people have been on. And so just having the one tenofovir, I'm wondering what are the limitations in terms of doing similar kinds of testing with other, other kinds of drugs? 
So you need a drug with a metabolite that has a long half-life like tenofovir. And I, I think tenofovir gives advantage because it can be used from for PrEP and it is in both of the standard routinely used single um, fixed dose combination drugs that are used there. So in that it's, it, you know, the, the, because the drugs are combined, mm -hmm. you got good concentrations of tenofovir, you kind of you know that the other drugs have been taken, uh, you know, so tenofovir, lamivudine and dolutegravir are in a single tablet. So if you have good, as are tenofovir and tricetabine and efavirenz. So if you have reasonable tenofovir concentrations, you can assume you would have reasonable other drug concentrations. I don't know, Lauren, I don't know if you know of any other drug moieties that are being looking at. You can look at m concentrations, but that doesn't have, it only also gives you a five to seven day window. It doesn't give you this long window. This is the first time that any drug concentration in an HIV setting has been shown to have um, impact. To, on, on virological outcomes and to be correlated with virological outcomes. So I haven't seen any other at this point, but because tenofovir is well used and is in a lot of treatment regimens, it is actually also quite a good drug to pick. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Um, I see that Kamagu and Serge uh, Kremis have their hands up. It's great to see both of you here, thank you. Um, so Kamagu, you wanna ask your question? I think they lowered their hand for the time being. So um, we'll go on to Serge. Oh, hey Serge. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thanks, Thanks so much. Um, great work for the uh, use of therapeutic drug monitoring. I was wondering, is is it always uh, adherence if you get low concentrations? So in other words, if you have, look at the individual patients who had had low levels of uh, tenofovir, were all of them not taking the pills or was something else, may, may something else have explained why they have such low levels? So a second question, but that I'll. Uh... Okay, let me answer that one first because I'll probably have forgotten this one if you ask another one. <laughs> um, so 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 essentially, because we it we saw that that also correlated with use of the wise pill device. So we are measuring adherence in more than one way. So in in my mind, there are things that do lower your turn off of phosphate concentration, like having a very low hemoglobin or having um, renal diseases or, or, or having a high BMI. But it was still, we put all those in as, 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 as factors in our, in our multivariate analysis. Um, and it's, it still seems to be the adherence that is most closely linked to the to the 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 the, the tenofovir diphosphate concentrations. Yeah, yeah. The, now that that I get, but it's more like yeah. if you go to an individual patient and said, yeah, you know, report back, you're not taking your drugs, and the and the patient said, well, but but I am. Um, um, are there any of those or or? Um... Lauren, I don't think so. Oh, well, that's that's even no. better, right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, the pe people were all the people get to know our team. We saw them certainly for M one over a year, every month, and right. actually, you, you develop quite a relationship, and people understand you want their honest opinions. So we didn't really struggle with with that. Can I ask an, uh, another question? Well, sure, go ahead, Serge. So. Um, I believe you mentioned that the levels uh, that you had in South Africa and your population were lower than in the U.S. and in some other population. Is is do you have an, is there an explanation for that? And, and, and any idea? Because it's really interesting. It's like, it is really interesting, and we don't have a really good explanation either. Um, and again, that's why we were checking BMIs and we thought maybe hematocrit would be lower um, across the board. Um, and 
we didn't we didn't we the study was sort of designed before we realized the impact that creatinine and renal function would have on this so we didn't really check that but um we don't actually have a great idea of why that happens it's potentially something pharmacogenetic but we didn't look at that so Catherine I remember th there was speculation from someone I don't know if it was Jose or someone else yeah. on a team about the generic version of the drugs and yeah. whether or not there was anything that could be operating there yeah, potentially the, the, the 300 milligrams of tenofovir in our generic version is not the same as the 300 milligrams of tenofovir in um, another one. But our um, regulatory bodies don't approve a drug unless they show bioequivalence with the brand name. So mm -hmm. it might be, but it, it it's, yeah, it didn't seem likely. But again, it's something we still need to know more about. Thanks. Do you have any speculation, Serge, since you work in this field? Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, no, I was hoping that I got the answer from you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it, the other issue, but I'm sure that uh, that that you, you you looked into it is is maybe some differences in the results between the South African assay and the um, or the, uh, mm. the, the maybe some stability issues uh, for the enough. Uh, although uh, the the AIM one data was done at Pete's lab. Yeah. So, but we were, for, yeah, for I mean, like storage and transport and right. So, but I'm sure that that was all covered. Uh, I, I mean, knowing Pete, that that's probably yeah. part of the, the whole validation of the of the assay and the studies. Yeah, I know that the, the the nukes are not stable just in a dry blood spot in a room. It does have to be frozen at minus eighty. Right. But our tracking and things of that, you know, and they were shipped on dry ice and the whole thing. So we didn't have any major like right. packages in that so sense. Right. Should just give you a lot of money to investigate that further. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Serge. Claude, I think um, I'm told you have you had your hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Claude. Mostly I wanted to say hi, and that was really fantastic. And it was so nice to hear you, both of your voices. And um, that was one thing. Um, and I really might have missed this, so I'll apologize. Um, I've got a little bit of COVID brain at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, you talked in the very beginning, Catherine, about you know youth do worse, children do worse at all ages. Um, and so I didn't necessarily see age. I know you're not working with children, children, but I did you show age? But I guess what I'm wondering about is yeah and i um i guess what i'm wondering about is that young people are more likely to not come to clinic a lot right and to miss appointments and wouldn't be captured in a study necessarily like this that's following people and just your thoughts about that and um there's a lot i like about this because it's technology and that might you know be interesting to them but just your thoughts about how to reach that population, how to bring them into studies like this and see if this would work. And adherence is clearly such a moving target for them. Does that make any sense, what I just said? Yeah. Lauren, do you want to say something? Because you're working with a young cohort now, a different different study. But... And then yeah. I have a follow-up question, but go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, so we are, we are working... Um with in a study with a group aged 12 to 24 years and um we've got different groups within the study um some who have been adherent and well controlled and then some who have really struggled and we do see a lot of um cycling in and out of care um in the sort of late teen years um and we have we have seen that once we have engaged them and recruited them into a study um there's definitely a lot more there's a, an improvement you know and I think that just speaks to the um additional care that they get when they are enrolled in a study so um it's not yeah we can I think in this study we didn't in adult we didn't really have a lot of young people um yeah. it was mostly people in their 30s um, so it would be interesting to do this sort of thing in a younger, in a younger group. 
And I know that, um, or at least Catherine does, and maybe you do too, Lauren, work with Ingrid Katz a bunch, and I'm on Ingrid's study. It's been so enormously hard for them, right, to recruit. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, using mobile vans and, you know, other things that Linda Gale has come up with. So um, I do think that is one of the challenges and it would be so interesting to think about how you could engage them, could a study like this bring them in in some ways? Um, Mm -hmm. And then my follow-up question was really about providers and that provider funding and your thoughts about your next steps, if you could say more. (laughs) I might let Bob talk about providers because I just get annoyed. <laughs> well, I, I, I find, you know, it's 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 you kind of think you like really you you get we engaged and we deliver you know and then and then like nothing happens. But I also feel for me that I'm a pharmacologist, so when it gets to the implementation piece, I want to hand it over to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's my impression, and I think you said it, Catherine. I mean, I think the providers are very well intentioned and, and care. And actually they, you know, and when I was there for the focus groups and they they were in favor of, of this kind of thing. And they thought this could be really helpful to their patients. I think, as you said, and, and your follow-up focus groups with them were that they busy, busy, busy. And, you know, it just, it, it just, you know, it was not, I mean, I think we have to think about the ways that, and how this evolves over time, the ways that providers get this information. And I'm I'm certainly thinking about the US, you know, and the movement towards everything being electronic, that alerts pop up on screens that they have to pay attention to. You know, if if, if providers there are still using charts and papers, they may not see the paper, but if it moves towards electronic, you know, um, medical records and alerts popping up, but more importantly, I think we collectively have thought, and I'm a I'm a, much a believer, and and actually I was I don't think I'm disclosing anything I can. I was just reviewing a lot of Croy abstracts, and um, you know I, I'm I'm always interested in the utility and the benefits of other cadre of workers, community health workers, peer workers. So, and you said it in your comments, Catherine, that um, I think integrating other people into the team who could take the time if they received the alert, whether that be a, a community healthcare worker or a peer navigator worker, receiving that information and having the trust of, on the team and having the trust with the patients to have that person take the time to reach out and spend time with the patients. That, that's, that's where my thinking goes. But I would love to hear thoughts from, from anyone else, including both you, Lauren and Catherine. Yeah, I think from for anything to be successful in the clinic setting, it needs to be fully integrated into the guidelines and, you know, even just into the stationery. You know, if there's a checkbox to look at this result, then that's going to prompt people to do it. I think where we had a problem was that it was just in, in the folder. It wasn't really integrated into their routine um, for clinic visits but uh, the problem we do see is like you say it's like the earlier alert you know it's not just when the person is back at the clinic sitting in front of you are you going to check that result it's like actually being alerted to an abnormal result which is something that the clinic struggle with in general yeah mm. can I can I make a comment I don't know if you can still hear me Yes, yeah. we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Katrina. Next. Yeah. No, no, no. I'll Learning be quiet Katrina. and I'll let other people go. <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, okay. um, no, I'm I'm thinking about our clinics here and our standard of care. And um, I mean, and yours, I know what it's like there. You know, it's um it's all about relationships. And I think you said this right at the beginning, Catherine, right? It's it's the only way people are gonna really talk about adherence and be willing to listen is when they have a relationship with the provider and the way our healthcare systems, I know this isn't what your talk was about, but that's part of the challenge, right? That, and you're, you know, the busier and busier that you your clinic is, you get what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes with the patient and it's really hard. To have relationships then and um i don't have an answer i just was another thought so i think this is also one of the things that, that you're doing this for is you are 
you are identifying using uh, technology to identify people who need support so that yeah. you can differentiate because you know if you are if people are very good and their tenofovir phosphate is high and and you know and their viral load at the next visit is suppressed and they're coming to collect their medications we shouldn't be bothering them they should be allowed to go and yeah. look after their own health you know but but for younger people or for people who are struggling or you know other other people who need more support we should be able to use these tools to to, to identify who needs that that support um that would be something so worth looking at yeah thank you yeah which falls under the, that broad term of differentiated care right differentiated service delivery yeah services and yeah um katrine i think you've been waiting with your hand up um thank you it was such an interesting talk for me to hear um i am just starting to work a little bit in this space and have the benefit of having inherited uh, nadia uh, Nguyen uh, on my team. So, and she, of course, brings all this historical knowledge from your study. So, um, I, I'm interested in the messaging of the drug levels, um, and I really love the simplicity of the the red, yellow, green. Um, and I understood that that was what was used in the sheets that you provided to the providers. Was that also how the message was communicated to the patients? I think so. I think so. In aim two. Yeah, the name too, exactly, yeah. Um, it was at their visits. So at it their visits, we could show them the, the colors. Um, but if they, they had different options for how they wanted to receive the message. So if it was a phone call, then we would just verbally explain the result. And there was a message attached to each color. You know, mm -hmm. so agree to say you're doing really well and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then some of the options were emojis, like a thumbs up and things like that. But um, the actual color coding, we could only really show them at the visits. Okay. And then because I was thinking we are also trying to develop an intervention that's around communicating drug levels. Um, and we, there's a lot, and it's, again, it's in the U.S. setting, and so we keep getting a lot of, um, we've done focus groups, and we get a lot of clients saying, like, well, why did you develop an app for, like, an animated video that explains this? And, like, because the constructs we're trying to explain are quite complex, uh, you know, it's, it's viral load, it's drug clearance in our case, and it's, and it's, and, and drug levels, and so so we've gotten this feedback again and again, like just make some videos that will help us explain it. Did, did you ever, but, but I actually love simplicity and I love things that are just, you know, red, green, yellow. And, and I think those can be very effective. So I wondered, have you ever considered other ways of communicating things like this or you, you didn't feel the need? We asked and well, we did what we were sort of told to by the, by the, the, the 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 participants so um and i think something to think about in our in our setting people at we, we people on treatments at the stage are sort of in their mid-30s and older around about there and they're not they don't all have like smartphones for video technology and things like that so often whatsapp is the limit of the mm -hmm of technology we can use and that is something we should, could potentially consider using i have a student at the moment using whatsapp for micro learning in nursing staff so that's possibly another way of transmitting information to people but we didn't explore it in this in the setting thank you okay i i see that um ruben has his hand up i'm also and and well before we go to ruben or while we go to ruben um there was a, a question in from an anonymous attendee in the Q and A. Um, ideally, how would you like to use this to further promote adherence? Um, which um, I think Catherine, you in part answered it in your comments. But if you want to think about that, Catherine and Lauren. Um, but Ruben, do you want to speak now? Yeah, uh, sure. It sort of follows that question in the in the Q and A box. What do you think the future of this is in terms of implementing it? You you alluded to it earlier. It's very expensive. 
Uh, having been part of the study, it's also quite laborious process to, to get that uh, blood, then put it on the card, dry it, send it to the lab and get it back. Um, you know, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, we, we've talked about this before, but I'm also curious to hear your, your latest thinking on that. So I don't think things have, in my mind, and things haven't moved on much. I think when we, we set out writing this grant, we kind of had the hope that by the time our five, seven year grant was up, there would be a point of care assay or something simpler, um, which I know Pete and Jose were working on at the time. And it just hasn't worked out that that has been something that they can do um, with the tenofovir diphosphate. So at the moment, as it stands, as I said, we could do five viral loads for the price of one tenofovir diphosphate, and we get the viral loads back in two to three days and the tenofovir diphosphate in 14 to 28 days. So it's like, it's hard without um, more science and more research and more steps up in this assay to feel that you could use it in our environment um on a, a sort of day-to-day -day basis i mean we just there aren't money there isn't the money for things you know and we you know we're already allowed one viral load a year so mm -hmm. to add in an assay that's costing 1500 rand is not going to happen unless it's even though it's clinically very useful and then we'd have to move into doing cost effectiveness studies at looking at if we found the right people and we used the niche and we improved outcomes and that is it cost effective to be doing this kind of thing. And, and that's not something we did either. Yeah. Lauren? I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> so lots of areas for future studies. There we yes. go. Let's, let's be writing a grant, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some grant writing. Uh, Susan, Susan Tross, and then, I'm, then I'll read some of the what I'm seeing in the q and I just wanted to confess that I was the anonymous person, and I didn't mean to be. I, I think this is an extremely... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an extremely elegant study, and, and I wish... Um, you know, that it was less costly because it, it just feels, I agree with Katrine, I, I, I can just see the, those colors and I, I think it could be a really powerful flashing message, but thank you. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, and if, if you have thoughts as you think about this, anyone um, to give this team ideas about um, future studies. Um, I'm gonna read, um, Kamago, unless you do want to come off and speak yourself, but you first put in a comment saying the difference in generic brands of um, tenofovir most likely is the bulking agents, not the actual active ingredient. We encounter this in many other drugs. Um, do you, are you able to speak? Do you want to speak? Okay, I, I see your name coming up, but it's like you're still on mute. And and Catherine don't, or Lauren, I don't know if you have a response to that comment about the um, bulking agents, not in the actual active ingredient. I'm gonna try. That's, that's what makes that makes sense to me. So the active ingredient should still be the same, and usually that is what is measured in the bioequivalent studies before a, a generic product is approved. So, um, so I know we spoke about generics being different, but it, it's you know, potentially not not the the solution we're looking for. Yeah. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, good. I finally got it on uh, to unmute. Okay. Thank you, Ka thank you, Catherine. You know, uh, I'm also a pharmacist, so that's why I know about the bulking agents and everything. I, I encounter that a lot with different drugs and everything. That patients respond better with this. They'll tell you that you know what? Uh, give me the green one, not the blue one, because yeah. you know I look at the different manufacturers, <laughs> and then I look at the bulking agents that they use. Some use uh, calcium phosphate, some use lactose, somewhat. Mm -hmm. So when it dissolves in the person's stomach. So one will respond better with this particular brand and then one not respond. So and because you know what brand names is gonna be of, of course very costly, especially if you're doing a study. Okay, then the next question I have that I typed it on the QA, uh, 
was actually for you again, Catherine, uh, since the adherence is the key to everything here, you know, in the study, do you think of uh, having things like a therapy, which was a work as a community pharmacy that is a, a associate, affiliated with a, uh, a program that is mainly treating HIV patients. So we developed something called therapeutic adherence program that promotes adherence, that gives the participants, like we give them a week supply of meds. And then when we achieve the viral load that we're looking for, we switch them to mm -hmm. monthly, to monthly mm -hmm. visits and give them a month supply. And then we're gonna sponsor events, you know, things like, you know, to just, you know, uh, make them congratulate them to feel like, you know, they are doing something. Because if you are lowly motivated, most likely you're not going to be doing following up and doing everything. So until we, those who get the U equals U, then we move them to six months visit. So do you think it's something that you, uh, in South Africa, I'm South African, by the way, do you think it's something that you can, you can really get to that you know you can have these therapeutic adherence programs like you know in certain clinics you know what to encourage people potentially i think definitely so, so there's a couple of things to talk about here one is that we are being pushed more and more to the people people saying a lot of people who don't adhere so this is a, like a, not part of this study but people who don't adhere sometimes it's the coming to the clinic that's a problem and yet our response to poor adherence is to give them more clinic visits and that it's a sort of self-perpetuating difficult cycle. And in fact, there's a strong push to, for us to think about differentiated service delivery for people who are doing badly to say, give them more drug, give them three months, give them six months now and let them go do their own thing because it's bringing them to the, they can't come to the clinic because they're working or they can't come to the clinic because of childcare or they can't, for whatever reason, and you're making them come more. And then in fact, we should be making them come less and sending people out um, with 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 more medicines rather than like babying them along, like just giving them free reign and letting people people go, um, and that might solve a chunk of our problems because a lot of some of well, quite a lot of our adherence issues are due to the system and the waiting times and the days you spend in spend in clinic. So, but I love the idea of a therapeutic thing. So we're, we're also working with Monica Gandhi at the moment, um, doing a study with her urine dips. Yeah, it's not a dipstick, it's a rapid assay. And we're using that, which, as I've said, it really, the assay in itself is only giving you like a three to five day window. And a lot of people could be taking the medication before they arrive at the clinic and it would still come up as positive in the urine but we're using the assay, which is $2 and cheap as a way of initiating an adherence conversation. So it's not being used if it's positive, if it's negative, it doesn't actually matter. What matters is that they're sitting with somebody who is having a conversation with them about adherence based on the fact that we can tell if they've taken a dose in the last few days or not. And we don't have outcomes of that yet on that study. Um, we're hoping that we'll you will have our first hundred to a year in time to get a late breaker for Croy, but that's probably very hopeful, <laughs> but we'll see. But it, it's like using something like this to initiate a conversation. And then in fact, it's not so much the therapeutic drug monitoring that's important as the conversation.